diagnosis, diagnosis of COVID also came with helping with some of the other um, pieces of their life that, that sort of had to come with them. And so we spent a lot of time trying to nuance to help with some of those nuances with people and relationships and pets and things like that. Um, so that just took a lot of time, um, something we weren't initially prepared for, but adapted to in our role in serving the individuals that we did. Um, you know, bandwidth is always is is always a challenge with with COVID right now. Um, just learning how these people need to be supported, how how our, our guests needed to be supported, how the staff needed to be supported, and how to to figure out how to work together and what the needs were even across agencies and contract holders um, was tricky because there were things that weren't super clear. Um, you know, when it comes to COVID, what is medical and what isn't seems like a really clear line, but sometimes it's not. <laughs> so, and that kind of leads into the second piece is just having enough medical support. Um, COVID at a, as a diagnosis um, in its severe form requires medical support um, sometimes, but um, can be managed without the need of medical support. But there was this in-between line that we were, um, you know, having to figure out and navigate as a non-medical facility in serving these individuals and making sure that they're safely sheltered and getting what they needed um, was definitely something that we had to work work with and constantly learn um, how to respond to. So, yeah. Did that cover some of the general overview? I'm totally open to questions and um, wherever you want me to take the conversation. Well, I encourage everyone to ask questions, um, but I have one I'll just kick it off with. And um, that is, I was involved somewhat in the really, really, really early conversations about the IQF. We weren't even calling it that, we were calling it something else. Um, but the premise was this is a place for anyone who can't safely isolate to go and meaning not necessarily restrict, um, exclusively for people experiencing homelessness. So I'm wondering now that it's all said and done, what, what percentage would you say were homeless and, and which just didn't have a safe place to isolate? I don't know if I can give you a percentage. Um, one, because you know, I didn't get to meet every face that came through. Um, and two, because we took over operations, you know, the last quarter of, of, of the um, program. Um, I would say, you know, a handful in comparison. I think we, ha we definitely had individuals who fit um, the scenario where they had a roommate who was incredibly vulnerable and it wasn't safe um, to, to isolate or quarantine with them because of risk of exposure and, um, and how their roommate may have handled um, COVID-19. Um, there were individuals who were doubled up or had um, you know, large families in the home where people didn't necessarily have their own room. And so it wasn't safe to isolate or quarantine in those homes. Um, there, you know, similar instance with a vulnerable individual, there were small children or infants in the home and it just wasn't safe. Um, we also saw partners, um, like married couples and children in some instances where it just wasn't safe for whatever reason to isolate and quarantine together. Um, so there, I mean, we absolutely served a population outside of individuals experiencing homelessness, um, but majority of our population was those who, who just didn't have anywhere to safely isolate or quarantine. Um, and I will say that, you know, we ended up being a landing pad for individuals who really had nowhere to go, even within some of the other um, service agencies in town, like the hospital um, was a huge partner and we were a huge resource for them um, just because sometimes they had medically complex individuals or people who um, really couldn't manage what they were experiencing on the streets. And COVID really gave those individuals a, a safe place. I mean, it, it's hard to see it in a positive light, but because they fit the criteria of COVID, they had a safe space to shelter and to be connected to resources and have somebody checking in on them. And so um, being as low barrier as we were was, I think, critical to our community during that time. And it was, um, it was nice to be able to offer that. 
I'm going to read a question that Vaughn put in the chat, and that's how many of the folks who had been at the facility at the time of closing had a set place to go afterward? That's a good question. So we actually didn't have anyone in the facility when it closed um, because, you know, um, transmission rates dropped so low in our community. We actually, our last person discharged um, about five days, I want to say, before the end of our contract and before we had to be out of the facility. So luckily we didn't have to carry over anyone or try to make arrangements for, for anyone um, sort of caught in between. Um, yeah, so, so thankfully that wasn't an issue. I will say we, I don't know how if folks are aware, but there is a new model that has opened up, which Road to Home has continued um, a contract with the health department to provide some sort of isolation only services. And we, um, effective today, we're open for admissions. And so we have a small section of a, a hotel that we can provide. Um, hotel rooms to individuals who've been diagnosed with COVID and have nowhere else to isolate. So we are able to continue that service um, for folks who do um, end up needing similar services as we go into um, the next few months and, and potential surges and, and variants. I have more questions unless others do. I have one. Go for it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Actually, I'm curious about your staffing model. It seems like with the, the surges, you know, the need and the, the population there would go up and down pretty abruptly. How, from a logistics perspective, how do you manage that? That's a good question. Um, I don't, I can share my experience. I don't think there's one way to do it. Um, we were very fortunate. <laughs> I think that's as simply put as I can, as I can state. Um, we had a base, a foundation of staff. Um, and, and all, quite frankly, the staffing agency that filled in that night shift were sending people during the day when we surged. We, you know, obviously experienced the Omic Omicron surge. Um, we saw that ticking up prior to Christmas and our capacity, like we were at capacity during that surge. And um, it was all hands on deck, as you can imagine. So we brought in staffing agency and then I hired, I hired people in the middle of the surge to come in and um, add extra support. Um, we actually also figured out our sweet spot for staffing, probably about end of January, early February, just in time to close down the facility. Um, and that was actually to build in another support we realized with a facility this as large as Motel 6 that there were so many logistical pieces to manage, not just guest support and guest needs, but the facility itself was a huge barrier in our ability to serve the community just because of the state of the facility itself, you know, plumbing issues, um, room maintenance and needs, um, just a lot of um, unforeseeable things that popped up. And so we finally figured out that we actually just needed another layer of support to manage the facility part part of things and then flex to filling in for this the staff on um on site who are working the shifts and working with guests directly so it evolved over time um but my approach to staffing in general especially for something such as a facility that that whose needs vary based on census was to just bring in people who had flexible schedules um, and staff people in a way that they they complement each other so that if there were needs um, across the week where they needed to trade or had excess hours available to work pick up shift with my staff um, so it, it, it's kind of multifaceted but um, yeah, I would say critically having that staffing agency was supportive at the time, um, but we certainly learned how to how to prepare for a response without that need um, after the search. <laughs> Did that answer your question, Chris? I'm going to ask questions until I run out of questions, but if anyone wants to jump in, please do, because my question shouldn't be the priority here, should be yours. Um, how did you manage things like 
laundry and transferring meals between guests who are staying there and also minimizing the risk of cross-contamination. So the systems that were set up, let's see, I'll do laundry first. So there were, um, so there's personal laundry and then there were linens. And so personal laundry, we had a system where um, uh, an organization was contracted with the health department to provide laundering services. And so they had certain bags they wanted us to use. We would label them with room numbers. We would have the guests bag their own laundry first, put it outside of their doors, and then we would rebag it in a non-contaminated bag. Like I said, label that and then store it in a location for the service to come and pick it up. And then they would return it with the same, with a fresh bag, obviously, and um, the room numbers labeled on them. So it was, it was a fine tuned machine by the time we came in. Um, and then for linen, a similar situation in that the contracted company to clean the rooms would bag the linen and then um, another service would come and pick that up um, regularly and then deliver fresh linens to us. Um, regarding food, so we, that was an interesting system. So Maple Alley Inn provided us three meal drop-offs per week. Um, it was enough food to last for um, three or four meals. And so we would deliver the food bags to guests, um, outside of their rooms. The, it was like a drop and dash, or we'd call them on the phone and, um, connect with them directly. And they would have, everybody had a microwave, a mini fridge, things like that in their room. So they could heat up the food. Um, we had all of the utensils and paper plates and things that they needed. Um, to, to eat off of. And so that was, that was the ongoing system for food throughout the day or throughout the week. Um, we did provide breakfast every day, um, a set number of, of, of food options for that, that they would request each day based on how they were feeling. And then we had a pantry system set up that was, that would supplement the, the three meals a day that we provided. Um, where they could get snacks and things that weren't provided to them on a daily basis, but that they could use a credit to purchase um, things that they would probably, you know, go to the gas station for, um, but to kind of keep folks feeling satisfied um, with some of that snacky food or things that just um, were comforting when you're isolating in your room by yourself. Um, so, yeah. So, and then, and then actually we um, had donations from the community on Sundays um, so the, the Maple Alley and provided food six days of the week. And then Sundays, both Little Caesars and McDonald's like donated food. And so we were able to kind of offer that as a, as a nice treat at the end of the week. Um, I know not the best food when folks are isolating and should be, you know, eating healthy, but, um, it's, it's about comfort and it's about getting folks to feel okay, um, in the space that we're providing for them, uh, to isolate safely and, and prevent the spread. So it, it worked and people were really happy about um, the food. They were really impressed with the quality and, and what we offered. So, so that's, those were the systems we had for, for linen and, and food. Fun has a question in the chat and that is, was funding readily available to address those maintenance issues? Yeah, so the county assumed responsibility for the facility. So if there were maintenance issues, um, the county would send out either county facilities, individuals or contracted with a, a maintenance provider to go in and, and repair and do what they needed to do. I'm gonna ask you another question and that's, um, did you have any issue with guests either wanting to socialize with each other or outside guests wanting to come into the facility? And if so, how did you manage that? Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so naturally folks want to socialize and interact with each other. Um, and, you know, sometimes people knew each other. Um, it was a little bit of policing and encouraging people to not go, you know, not go into other people's rooms or to maintain distance, make sure they're wearing their masks. 
Um, I think overall people were really understanding um, and, and cooperative in that respect. Um, you know, it, it, it was harder when the facility was more full, right? Because people are door to door to each other. So they're going to run into each other and see each other. Um, but we did everything we could to manage um, the gathering and prevent folks from coming down in groups. So we tried not to like, you know, there, that's why there was no serving of meals where people kind of come down and get their food together. Um, the drop in the, the drop and dash method worked really well for that so that we were providing supplies directly to their door and not asking them to gather. And then regarding individuals trying to come in, you know, it was allowed for folks to come to the gate, to the fence and communicate and see their friends and family. Um, you know, so, so when it came to um, friends and family visiting, we didn't have any issues, folks trying to come in. Um, we, I, I, we didn't experience it, but I think early on the, the team who was working experienced people thinking it was still a motel six and coming in and trying to get a, a motel, a room for the night, which I think was really challenging for them because they're like, no, you need, you need to leave. Like you can't be here. Um, uh, luckily they had done all that hard work for us and we didn't really um, experience that during our time operating the facility. Um, Occasionally we had to uh, enforce folks um, staying out of the facility. And it was mostly around like dropping things off for guests and just trying to maintain um, protocols to prevent, you know, the spreading, um, the virus spreading. And so people were generally pretty understanding. Um, yeah. Eden has a question in the chat and it is, for about what percentage of the period that Road to Home managed the facility essentially at or close to capacity? I can't give you a percentage, but only during the time of the Omicron surge. So when we took over, I think it was after the first or um, that the second variant surge um, and it was pretty slow for a while. We had 10 or under um, for most of the time up until early to mid-December when Omicron started surging. And then it stayed um, pretty busy. And we were only at capacity for a brief time, you know, that end of December into like early January, we were pretty full. And then... Um, and then numbers dropped and we were at 20 to 30 for a few weeks, even after the initial peak of the surge. And then we saw the numbers start dwindling um, into March. Michael, has a question. I, oh, I'm sorry. I thought no, you were I done. was just gonna comment on it. <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so the question was, what, uh, what was the average stay or typical length of stay? Um, you know, I can't tell you overall what the average length of stay was, um, definitively, cause we kind of, we kind of calculated it month by month. Um, and, but, but folks stayed right between 10 and 14 days. Some folks ended up being there 21 days. Some folks were there less, um, less than the 10 to 14 days, just depending on, on the symptom onset. Um, and then, you know, sometimes on a very rare occasion, there was like a, a discharge delay where somebody was going into a treatment facility and just needed one more day. Um, so, you know, we, that was um, generally pretty rare and circumstantial, but on average, I mean, folks were there for their 10 to 14 days. I mean, it was, it was in that window um, for most folks. I don't, Michael, did that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a firm number for you. Um, I'm going to ask another question. I'm really full of them today. Um, what's the referral path to the secondary location that you're able to manage going forward? Yeah, so referrals will be sent. Let's see. Um, you know, I 
I think, so before, sorry, before the health department was a little more involved in the referring referral process, if you weren't a, like a, a, a designated referring partner, then you had to go through the health department. I think they're trying to, to move away from that. And I think people would just contact Road to Home directly. And so I'll put the email in the, um, in the chat for the supervisor email who would receive referrals. Um, in the process for that, there's a set of paperwork that you would complete, just kind of just indicating um, the individual's test date. I think, you know, it has to be positive. So we're doing just the isolation only, no exposures. Um, and just some basic information about the individual. Uh, they have to agree, they have to voluntarily consent to come to the facility um, and, and enroll in the program and abide by the code of conduct. Um, and then what would happen is a screening conversation would happen with the supervisor and the referring partner over the phone just to initially screen and make sure they qualify for the new model of care um, because there are, there are more criteria for, um, for enrollment into this second program. And then what would happen is our, our supervisor case manager would actually go out and then interview the individual um, to ensure that they're understanding what they're volunteering um, to participate in and um, make sure they're fully aware of, of how to get their needs met and um, what, the, what to expect at the facility. And so I'll put that um, in the chat right now. And I can put the phone number as well. There's a phone that um, the supervisors, case managers hold on to during the day. We are only in office um, during the daytime shift and accept referrals between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. So I'll put all that in the chat. Thanks, Ashley. Any other questions? Yes, I have yeah. more, but I won't get crazy. I, I'll, I'll chime in. I got a quick one, I think. Were there yes. folks that stayed there on more than one occasion? Yes. Yes. And I, um, I do know that later on, um, in the pandemic, you know, re requirements changed about whether or not people had to isolate a second time. Um, and I, I want to say that sort of changed while we were operating because initially we accepted people and then got word actually, Oh, they were just there. They don't have to be there again. Um, but yes, we absolutely saw people who, uh, returned. Um, I have two questions. One is, did you figure out kind of a ratio of staff to number of guests? And then my other question is related to an earlier one, and that is, in this new facility, I'm assuming that there's people who don't have COVID staying there too. How will you manage that cross-contamination potential? Yeah. Um, so staffing ratio... It's tricky because some folks really required more time and more, more staff resources um, because we ended up taking in individuals who were more medically complex. There was a lot more care coordination that was needed. And so we were, I mean, uh, one of my poor supervisors, uh, she's, she is such a go-getter and she can get a yes out of anyone. And so she was on the phone with every pharmacy in town and trying to get the right medication for individuals and had to sometimes send the, um, send the communications back to the doctor's office to get the prescription, you know, renewed. And so, I mean, that was the reality. Some days were spent chasing prescriptions. Um, and, and then, you know, when we were surging, our biggest priority is making sure everyone was safe and okay. And that we were managing symptoms and, and staying on top of those changes. If there was some, like any sim, um, symptom, like increases or new developments. And so I'd say, you know, for us, um, a rough ratio was two staff for up to about 20 people um, because one person is tending to the needs of individuals and one person was doing all of the care coordination, coordinating future referrals, coordinating discharges, 
Um, and then managing the facilities, the needs, coordinating food drop-offs and linen and things like that. So um, at base, that was about um, oh, the, the ratio before we needed to bring in another person to help support. And then the second question was about preventing cross-contamination and spread, is that right? Okay. So at the, the hotel that we are utilizing for this um, extension of the contract, we have a floor of the, um, of the hotel that isn't highly utilized. And so we have a section or a block of rooms that are only gonna be used um, for isolation purposes. And what we were told is that they're really not going to um, have anybody utilize the third floor if they can help it. I think if we had all of our rooms full, there would have to be a conversation about blocking off part of the hallway or, or doing some sort of um, infection control efforts. But as, as it stands right now, that's not an issue. We have a stairwell dedicated exclusively to our residents, our guests. And there's an elevator that we can use that minimally interferes with the rest of the facility. Um, and so, and then all of our guests will come and go through a side door, um, not going through the main entrance. Um, we'll be firmly enforcing universal mask wearing anytime folks are outside of their rooms, things like that. Um, because, we, th because we no longer have a hallway to the outdoors, we have to be really mindful about, um, about you know, just the potential for infecting other people. And so our, to protect the staff and um, and then of course other guests or, or staff that are coming and going between the hallways um, or the floors, all, most all of our interactions are gonna be a little more virtual just because congregating in the hallway um, isn't gonna be the safest um, interaction. And so as much as we can defer to the phone, we will. Um, though face-to-face -face interactions may still be required, you know, in the event of emergency or just to check on folks for symptoms. But, but that's what we're, we're going to try to emphasize um, initially to make sure that our staff are safe and that we can continue to staff the program. So um, does that answer your question, Terry? Yes, and I'm going to ask one more and then I will stop riddling you like with this interrogation here. Um, I don't mind. <laughs> you, you touched on the referral path as directly to road to home, but can someone self refer, refer or can provide like, can a service provider refer? Does it have to be a medical service provider? Um, individuals have self referred in the past. What we've done is we've asked them to connect with that and a little more investigating about symptom onset and things like that. Um, I think I'm going to have to ask to see how involved they will be in the referral process moving forward. We, you know, we, we just finished getting into the facility and setting up within the past 24 hours Like we've been working and, and getting set up. So we haven't been fully operational yet. Um, but if people reach out to us directly, we can certainly make sure that they're talking to the right people. If it's not us, um, to make sure that they, they go through the right avenues. Um, and then, I mean, I want to say that, yeah, I, I'm going to have to find out what the health department prefers. If it's not a designated referring partner currently, um, I'll find out and let, and, and let you know, Terry, so you can disseminate it to the, the group, um, about whether or not folks can just refer directly to us from any agency and self self refer, or if they need to go through the health department. So I'll find out for you. Thanks for the time being for this group. If someone has a, um, a client they're concerned about, should they just call you and talk through the process? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and that's in the chat. You know, I didn't notice if anyone here is on the phone exclusively, but I think just to be safe, I'm going to read out your contact information, which the phone number is three six zero. 594-1161. Uh, referrals are Mondays through Fridays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And the email is iqfsupervisor at road number two home.org. Not the word number, just road to home.org. 
Ashley, thanks for being patient with um, all my curiosity. And I'm just going to be transparent that I have an ulterior motive and I want to learn as much as I can before we embark on um, providing respite care at the way station. So you'll probably hear from me again. Um, Absolutely. Anytime. And thanks so much for, for all your org does to, to serve um, this population. It's just very appreciated that you always step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on with the agenda here. Um, and the next item is um, an update from the steering committee for the coalition. The steering committee um, uh, wanted to take some action and one of the areas they felt was worthwhile to discuss was our community's ongoing efforts to provide severe weather sheltering. And that can be a really broad topic as we discovered when we first convened. So we have kind of a small subcommittee of folks that meet and discuss this. So there's some really experienced people who are participating. I'm looking at Hannah, she doesn't know, but Hannah Hartman um, has experience doing this kind of shelter extensively and provided some materials for us to review. And the conversation in light of the weather, the flooding, the summer smoke, like how broad and how narrow is, is realistic. And the group decided that really that they, all of it is needed, but we really need to narrow down on something that we can, is actionable. And so choosing to focus on extreme cold. Um, so we've been meeting to talk about that. But meanwhile, while we're meeting, the county and the city are both working on the same thing. So I just want to, and I'm sure Chris will talk about this in the county update, but um, the county is working to launch um, a request for proposals, an RFP for organizations who are interested in providing severe weather sheltering you know, in, in the next winter season. And that's um, coming out this, um, this month, later this month. And the city has worked pretty hard to really develop a comprehensive operations plan um, how to provide some daytime warming um, services. So um, if it's okay, Katie Sullivan, would you mind talking a little bit about that? You've done a ton of work in that regard. If you'd share that out, it would be great. Um, yeah, sure. Thank you, Terry, for um, kind of that, that context. Um, I kind of want to speak about the planning work um, kind of from a broader perspective, but also speak a little bit as to kind of the genesis of the warming center and why um, kind of the city's plans for the warming center kind of mobilized the way that they did. Um, so I guess a little bit of background on kind of this work. So going into the winter season, um, initially the city didn't have plans to open and operate a severe weather warming center. Um, you know, typically we at the city don't operate shelters. Um, really typically our role in the system is to fund community partners in uh, their work to provide services and shelter um, to those who need it. So the city strategy going into the winter season um, was really, um, and our understanding was really that there are resources available to serve individuals experiencing homelessness in the event of severe weather. And our strategy was to lean on these community partners um, to provide that coverage in the event of severe weather. Um, you know, looking at the landscape, our community had Christ the King expanding their overflow um, shelter to help um, support the capacity limitations at base camp. They were gonna be open for five months this winter season as opposed to three months, um, which has been the case in previous years. We had also gotten approval from our council to fund the operations of a drop-in shelter operated by Northwest Youth Services um, and for up to 25 young adults. And we also knew that Ferndale had plans to um, open up an emergency shelter, severe weather shelter in the event of um, a severe weather emergency. Um, so yeah, so that was, so going into the winter season, since the overflow facility had opened up um, in mid-October, none of the emergency drop-in shelter providers had been precariously close to reaching capacity. Um, so our strategy was really to lean on these partners. Um, so that was a strategy we we're moving forward with. And then kind of the cold weather spell 
that our community experienced at the end of December came to pass and folks at the city really went into emergency management mode. Um, it was then that our mayor made the decision to stand up an emergency daytime warming center. Um, and this warming center that was stood up was um, mobilized across multiple days, the last week of December. And it was really operated on the fly. Um, the center had an anchor staff of volunteers who worked at the site over multiple days. Um, there was virtually no operational planning that was put in place for the center. Um, and at the end of the cold spell, the volunteers who had worked at the warming center reported back that it was a useful intervention for individuals who may have been trespassed or couldn't access kind of our our uh, existing emergency drop-in centers, and that this warming center that the city stood up provided a really necessary service to individuals who otherwise might not have had a place to go. So after this um, cold spell, after that warming center was stood up, it became apparent that we at the city needed to pivot our strategy and include a plan to open a severe weather warming center um, in the event of severe weather in the future winter months. So from there, once that decision was made, the ownership of the operation shifted from the administrative side of the city and the mayor's office um, over to my division, the Department of City Planning and Community Development. Um, once we in community development had ownership of the program, we could get to work on planning, all of the different details that go into standing up an emergency intervention like this. Um, so I guess speaking a bit to the planning of the space, um, the first item that we tackled was identifying an appropriate space for this program. Um, the library lecture room made sense for this type of intervention because the lecture room, which is normally booked solid to accommodate programming, um, was closed to community partners because of COVID. Um, I don't know if the library lecture room would make sense for this type of intervention in the future um, because it doesn't have air conditioning. So I don't, in the event of extreme heat, but that's a later discussion. Um, but it was determined to be an appropriate space for this program. Um, the second task at hand was developing an operations plan to outline what the protocol would be to mobilize the space and place it in service. Um, for the purposes to activate the space, we use the same guiding assumptions that Whatcom County utilized to activate their overnight operations. Um, the thinking there was then there would be continuity across the spaces. Um, and essentially, the guiding assumptions outlined that the space would be placed in operation if the temperatures reached a threshold of 28 degrees. Um, there was also uh, precipitation and kind of wind factors that went into compelling that decision. Um, for staffing the operation, we used a volunteer model um, that had propped up the uh, warming center at the end of the year. So we utilized a lot of the volunteers who had stepped up at the end of the year to run the warming center and recruited additional volunteers through volunteer networks maintained through a variety of different channels, uh, the BPD, um, community initiative networks, including cast and local uh, religious groups. Um, for training the volunteers, we really had to rely a lot on our community partners to lend their expertise. You know, we at the city have a lot of experience in contract management and policy analysis and community planning, but collectively, we don't really have a lot of experience and knowledge in standing up and staffing an emergency shelter intervention. Um, so uh, through the support um, and shout out to Terry and Marisa and their teams, um, we were able to support our volunteers and provide de-escalation training and other broader theme training to our volunteers, including boundary setting, uh, guidance, tips for enforcing COVID-19 protocol through both a pre-recorded hot team training and through Nietzsche Academy, which is it, for folks who aren't familiar, it's an e-learning platform that offers a number of different social service uh, related training tools online. Um, additionally, we connected some of our volunteers to our community paramedic who outlined best practices on handling any medical issues that may um, have transpired on site. Um, 
Once our volunteers were trained, we turned our attention to more of the administrative elements of propping up an operation like this. Um, things like developing various center policies and identifying and procuring supplies um, that we needed to run the center effectively. Um, we also cross-coordinated with the HOP team to support the operations of the center um, should the center ever be put into effect. Um, so what this means is that we um, didn't really expect our volunteers who would be working at the center to have that expertise or that lived experience or that lived knowledge to make referrals to the various housing and supportive services um, agencies offered in this community. So we really leaned on the HOT team to be available to provide the support to guests and provide uh, referrals to shelters and other services and de-escalation support if necessary. Um, we also plan to lean on the HOT team to really lead the volunteers on site when the center uh, should the center ever be activated and manage the room and ensure that guests followed um, the outlined code of conduct uh, policies for the operation. Um, we had also planned to um, support the HOT team by having one high level city official on site at all times to be on call in the event that volunteers ever needed de-escalation support, um, support folks if there was ever an escalated medical event um, and 911 had to be dispatched to the site and respond to any like press inquiries or advocate inquiries that should transpire on site. Um, so what did this operation look like when placed into practice? Um, so we actually don't know, the temperature never necess necessitated um, the operation to be mobilized and placed into service. So I can't really speak to any of the lessons learned as far as what was beneficial to carry over into other severe weather operations and what challenges would need to be addressed in future programs. Um, but it wasn't all for nothing. I think the hope here is that a lot of this planning work can be utilized for future severe weather interventions at the city plans and provide kind of that rough framework for how to proceed in the event of another severe weather emergency. Um, some changes I would like to see for future severe weather options. Um, I, I don't know if it's possible, but I think we've spoken about um, how we would like to see more um, of a move away from a volunteer staffed model. Um, I think when we talk about the individuals who need to be kind of served through this kind of model um, and their, their needs, um, the, the population has a high degree of needs and needs a high degree of support from the staff they're interacting with. And I am really grateful to the network of volunteers that we recruited um, and who offered to perform this labor for free. Um, but I don't necessarily know if this network has the experience necessarily to kind of meet those needs and provide that level of service and support. Um, another change that we'd like to see in future uh, planning um, operations is, again, this operation was that was stood up at the end of the year was really an ad hoc planning effort. So there wasn't as much intentionality as I would have liked around procuring supplies or developing maybe the best set of policies around how to address medical issues that may have transpired on site or COVID-19 protocols to enforce. So hopefully we can really th think through this in future operations and identify best practices that make sense here and vet those with folks who, you know, may actually have kind of that experience in setting up an operation and operating a program like this. Um, so yeah, I think there is a lot of room for improvement. I think that the fact that the warming center um, was stood up at the end of the year is, is a feat considering that that wasn't necessarily the strategy going into the season. And the fact that the city was able to pivot and open up something quickly, um, I think is worth noting. I think a key lesson learned in this process is that the city might not be the most equipped to actually operationalize and institute this programming. I think ideally in a perfect future, a program like this would be stood up and operated by a third party operator. Um, ideally a community partner with experience in setting up and operating an emergency <laughs> drop-in shelter and the city would fund this effort. Um, but we'll see if there's any community interest there. Until then, we have a basic framework in place for 
future severe weather emergencies and future severe weather centers. Um, and we're of course open to all feedback and eager for any and all community suggestions about how to improve our efforts um, and our planning. Um, again, I don't know if it was a perfect planning process, but we were really grateful um, for an enthusiastic and really dedicated pool of volunteers and really, really generous community partners who helped shape and navigate the planning process. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, I just want to mention that um, Vaughn was asking about the, the training course. So also um, the trainer is Ryan Dowd. He's very um, personable and digestible. I don't know if that's the right kind of word, but it's, it's really an engaging training. And if you can't access the chat, you can look into Ryan Dowd or the Librarian's Guide to Homelessness at www.homelesslibrary.com. And then Doug has a question, uh, who staffed the site at the center? You touched on that somewhat. Sounds like it was primarily volunteers, but I'll go ahead and let you answer, Katie. That's correct. It was primarily volunteers um, as well as some uh, city staff members. Um, the mayor was actually there for a few days at the end of the year, some council members. So it was primarily a core group of volunteers um, and city staff members. Thanks, Katie. So that is really helpful. So the, oh, Michael, go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Katie, um, <clears throat> thanks for, for doing all that work for us. Um, so as you say, this was ad hoc. Uh, it'd be nice if it wasn't so ad hoc in the future. Um, I think I agree with you completely that ideally the city we're a funding agency and that if we could find a partner and stand them up financially and grow that capacity, like in so many things we're trying to do, right? Um, I, th I think it would be good to move it into out of directly the government's hands and into uh, a nonprofit sector, I think for friendliness and credibility maybe also. I mean, we're the government, so many people don't like that fact. Um, but my question is, what do other communities do? Um, winter is a seasonal phenomenon across the United States. Did we look and our other communities have that expanding emergency weather shelter capacity? And is that usually all government provided or is it the indirect government support of a private entity? What, you, what usually happens, if anything usually happens? Um, that's a good question. Um, we didn't do a robust analysis of other jurisdictions and what they were doing, um, but we did see kind of across other communities that there were a lot of um, faith-based organization-led efforts um, on the severe weather um, emergency shelter front. Um, and I believe City of Spokane did a um, city-led effort, um, which I can get more details on and and. Uh, sent to Terry for circulation if there's interest there. I guess the question is, is there consensus on the best approach or no consensus really at this point? I think there's certainly probably a set of best practices that are out there. Um, and I think it, uh, these best practices would probably outline um, you know, a really intentional planning process and kind of all of um, these different operational elements that um, that I think make sense and, and have probably proven successful in other jurisdictions. Um, so yeah, I think there's part of um, where we're at now is we are kind of debriefing internally from these severe weather interventions and seeing kind of what our chief takeaways um, were and what we did right, what um, there, where there's opportunity to grow. And I think that this question around best practices is gonna be um, kind of a key detail that's going to inform a lot of our future work and and kind of help mold the framework that we have um, that we put in place. Uh, you can have a question. Uh, yeah, no, I, I had just a short statement to add to to this. Uh, I I, th I think that um, you know, it, it was asked like, what can be done? I like we can talk about what's quote unquote best pra practices or not. But the fact is, is that people who are trapped out in the cold, if it's a severe when, uh, severe weather event or year round when it's not a severe weather event, the number of people who are actually on the streets or who are homeless is a finite number of people. Um, and it can be, you know, 
uh, you can put a serious dent in it. And I think that, and I think that you will, you will always need severe uh, weather shelters or whatever when the situation gets um, to that point. But if you have more and more of year round where it's not just about everybody shuffling around right at the moment when a crisis hits and then it's temporary for two months or three months and then they go back out to where they are if, if, where they were if if you had something if you had more that was year round you would actually get that number of people who would be caught in a crisis when it gets cold or it gets too hot uh would not hit the crisis point at all and so uh i'm not saying that you can ever really get rid of it but like you know thinking of it uh, of more year-round options for people prevents the emergency from occurring in the first place. That's the only thing I wanted to add to that, and I'll, I'll leave the rest to you guys. Thanks for that, Doug. There, there's a, another question um, about why does it have to get so cold before we open? Can we open it when it's not so cold? And I, I know that this has um, been a topic that has been discussed um, quite a bit by local government. Um, and I was not involved in that process to arrive at that number. What is it, 28 degrees to open? I wonder, Katie, if you can, or even Chris can speak and, to. And, and one thing I wanted to add, sorry, because you responded to what I, I just said, is that it, if you had more year round options as a, a normal option, then you could perhaps raise that level of degrees. You could raise it to 32 degrees or 33 or 34 degrees because the pool of people that need it when a severe weather event happens would be smaller and it, it, the amount of money required to, to cover it at a higher temperature would be available. And so that, I don't know, that's my thoughts. So, sorry, but I don't mean to interrupt, bye. Yeah, I, I can chime in real quick. And, and thanks, Doug. You're absolutely right. You bring up a really important piece of this equation. Um, I was kind of on the sidelines a few years ago when that, that discussion took place. And there were folks arguing for, you know, 50 degrees or 55 degrees if it's rainy outside. Uh, we looked at other jurisdictions around the country, and some of them are more in the 20, 15 degree range. So it's there's a, a huge range of responses. But ultimately, it comes down to how many nights are we going to be open? So we had 28 degrees kind of as a, a compromise that nobody really liked. Um, last, this last winter, that meant eight nights of operations. Um, you know, the, the lower that number, the fewer the nights, the higher the number, the more nights there are. And that's based on how many people are we gonna serve and how much is it gonna cost to do that. So as you, as you raise that temperature, you raise the price tag um, and you factor in these other things like Doug was saying, if you have more more units of emergency shelter around the calendar, then there's there's less of a need during the winter to add extra uh, capacity. So all those things are factored into it. I'm not gonna say that I have any any answers as to where it should be set, but those are the kinds of considerations that are behind those numbers. Thanks, Chris, I appreciate that explanation. Um, I just, what do I wanna say here? I made notes. I do know what I want to say. I want to acknowledge, like, it's difficult to attract volunteers on a moment's notice who are perfectly trained. And it's difficult to do that in a day warming center, right? But to do that overnight temporarily is even more difficult. And something that um, Bridget Reeves from the mission shared with us in our, our small group of discussing this is that the more complex the need, the more difficult it is to attract volunteers and attract qualified volunteers. So it's a little easier during the day to, to look to nonprofits, right? Because we're all working during the day. Really tough to ask a nonprofit employing people working nine to five to then work five to nine. And, and so that brings us to our challenge. And this is not gonna be a surprise to anybody. We struggle with this every year, locating an operator. So one thing we discussed as a smaller group was how can we support the county or the cities um, efforts to attract an operator. Because when we looked around the room, we're, we all have a lot of skills and expertise. And maybe we can do things that would prevent an organization, maybe a smaller organization that could do overnight, to kind of get over those hurdles of recruiting volunteers, locating um, training, figuring out how to do an RFP, figuring out how to write an operating plan, what kind of forms do you need? And so we were thinking of 
why don't we assemble something kind of like a companion guide to an RFP to kind of e- ease the lift. So it's not just the city or the county saying, come on out, apply, but it's us as a community saying, we need, we have this need and here's how we can support you. So to that end, I'm going to put a link in the chat. It's a survey monkey. Yeah. Okay. And this is, um, I'm asking you to, to take a look and fill this out. SurveyMonkey says it only takes two minutes, but really what we're soliciting is what do you have? What can you offer? What would you provide to something that could really support anyone who's interested in applying that we as a community can support that operator? So I would love to get a lot of information from that, bring it back to this group, synthesize it, take the expertise we have and potentially figure out how we can do this better. And I also challenge you to think beyond this winter. We, we have to get out of this cycle of, oh God, it's winter. Winter happens every year, <laughs> right? Let's think about ongoing, what, what can we do to provide this support um, in the long run? And this comes with a commitment, probably on steering, but man, I open it up to anyone who wants to help this because there's a maintenance aspect to this too. We can't just put together a guide and then leave it alone and expect it to be accurate next winter. So this is something we're going to have to revisit as a group um, to try to resolve this problem. Because the cities and counties are not experts in homeless services. It's like asking the hospital administrator to take out your appendix. You don't want that. You want the hospital to hire a doctor. And that's really what our local governments are saying. They're saying, we're not the doctor. Can a doctor come in here, please? Here's some money. So that's my pitch to you all. Um, please do the monkey, survey monkey. Um, and that's kind of all I had to say about that, but it looks like Doug has his hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't wanna take up too much time or anything, but um, I, you mentioned like, how do you get volunteers to, to work during the hours that, that, that aren't normal workday stuff, okay? So this goes back to like how we operate as homes now homes now is an all volunteer organization we have no paid staff we manage two villages and we house around 50 people and we have no paid staff. we're on a shoestring budget at all times now one of the ways you can fill this gap and you can actually get it to um to to be a 24 7 operation is if there are people who need to be served who can who are competent enough to act in a staff capacity in order to actually keep something operating um, on a 24 seven basis. And if you have to rely on volunteers who have a normal job or whatever, uh, you can only rely on them at certain times at certain places and you can't actually get a schedule together very easily or anything. But if somebody needs the shelter and they are able to help operate the the place, uh, you can create a stable situation that lasts for years or more. without any money or without any um we need money and everybody needs money but like without um the having to pay staff on a daily basis and stable enough to where you're going to be much more stable than if you're in a tent or in the woods or whatever and so that's all i wanted to add that there that if they're if the city or anybody they're not experts in it but if somebody who's been homeless they're an expert in it they've been homeless they know what it's like and what they have to deal with and so the main our main volunteers are people who are homeless that live there and um judge it how you will one way or the other but um i think that there's some avenue for that for for preventing um the the emergency from occurring because a situation is stable enough and people that are in that position and a low income situation uh, an extremely low income situation ca- are able to capably manage it. Um, of course, problems still occur, but yeah. Thanks, Doug. And before I go to Michael, I want to catch this question that Vaughn asked. Is an operator strictly defined by a registered nonprofit or private entity? I think, and um, Chris and Katie, help me here. It, the operator needs to be an entity that can take legal responsibility. So you need to carry insurance, right, to protect the people that you're serving. And something that a lot of folks don't understand about city and county and other government contracts is they're frequently on a reimbursement basis. So you have to have some money 
to pay for your expenses and then invoice. So anyone who can, has capacity to do that and to sign as a legal entity to be responsible, I think would be an operator. Was that a fair description, Chris and Katie? Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, we're looking for nonprofit agencies, people that are licensed and registered and insured, as you said, Terry. Thanks. Michael. I'm just going to brainstorm a bit. Um, I've been thinking about all the time about how do we get new partners? How do we grow partners from the ground up? Um, I'm familiar with the Sea Feast. The Sea Feast is this celebration out the waterfront of fishing and food and, and waterfront culture. Uh, that was um, propped up, created with funding from the city using tourism support dollars. And what we had done in the past is say, hey, anybody got a legally eligible tourist event, apply to a grant, we'll help you fund it. But we did in that case is we held back money. So we had a big pile of it and said, we're going to instead use this as seed money. And it was like $75,000 a year. And then it was like 75, 75, 50. The idea is that we would give you like a three-year startup grant and you would come up with a community event. So Sea Feast is no longer funded by the city, right? It was started with a startup grant. Would a startup grant idea work for standing up a nonprofit with the idea being that it's not perpetual support, but it's like startup grant money, three years money. How do nonprofits emerge that are gonna be enduring and that they can staff up um, and train people and, you know, is a startup grant a good idea? You don't have to answer now. <laughs> I can chime in. If, um, I don't know if Terry, you want to respond. I just, as a, a recently started nonprofit, um, what I can say is, I think three years is a good timeline to be looking at. You're talking about recruiting, training, developing policies, um, and so. I would say that if there was also some sort of um, like added support or like if there was some type of nonprofit um, startup like plan or something like, like these are the steps, these are something to help because the, the unfortunate thing about nonprofits that I'm learning is through some of my peer groups is that nobody really knows how to do it. They just like start and then they learn as they go. And so having somebody with seed money start with their best foot forward, I think would also be best served if there was like, if there was some sort of plan and, and or some something to help them get started in regards to how nonprofits are structured and organized and all the things that are needed. So that would just be my two cents is that that piece would probably be helpful to go with it. I would just say just all of that, Ashley, but I would say what Michael's identified, that's the rub, right? Um, the reason that we keep looking to the same nonprofits and usually larger is because they have multiple funding streams. So they can float that expense until they can invoice. That is real tough when you're a small startup. So if, and I, I don't know how to get over that barrier. I leave that to our administrators in the group, but um, that's kind of the thinking I had behind creating this resource guide. Like we don't have money, but we have a lot of brains and a lot of skills. We could probably collectively put that together to support any small nonprofit that's trying to make a go of it and to fill this role. Um, before we go to Doug, and I'm, I'm mindful of time because we have a couple of um, updates still before we get to the end of the uh, meeting here. But Dina um, says, it seems that one of the challenges this winter with volunteers, at least with the county's warming shelter because of the ad hoc nature, was that many volunteers were lined up and then called off, lined up and then called off shifts. So a question would be, how could the centers be reliably planned so that volunteers would have a stronger assurance that their services would be needed and used? And that is, a, that's a little bit of a fortune teller question. Needing to know how many people show up, how much space do we have to offer? When is it gonna happen? How much time are we going to ask people to volunteer? And we don't know that because we can't predict the weather. So that's my off the hip reaction. But if anyone else wants to chime in, go ahead. 
and um, then I'll also leave it. I think Doug, do you have another question? Uh, no, I'm. I. It's moved on. I'm good. Okay. And then Michael, did you have something to add? Okay. Hands up. All right. If it's cool, I would like to move on to the next point on the agenda because I want to be respectful of time here. And that's um, an update from the city, but I kind of feel like we kind of got one from Katie already. I actually have a couple and I can breeze through them really, really quickly, um, but I'm going to ask for this group's help. Um, so the first update I want to provide is on um, the draft home ARP allocation plan that we at the city have been working on. Um, and we recently published online for public comment. Um, so just a little bit of background, the American Rescue Plan Act um, of 2021 signed into law in March, 2021, um, was intended to provide relief to communities, um, individuals, businesses that have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Congress appropriated 5 billion of this funding um, to address the needs specifically of individuals experiencing homelessness and other qualifying vulnerable populations through housing, supportive services and emergency shelter. Um, this funding is allocated by formula to jurisdictions and it's anticipated that the city of Bellingham is gonna get about $2 million in this funding. Um, in order to receive our funding, however, we need we are required to develop a home ARP allocation plan and community stakeholder consultation and public participation is essential in the development of this plan. Um, so I want to announce to you all that our draft plan has been published and is now open for public comment. The public comment period for the city's draft home ARP allocation plan is going to remain open until Monday. April 18th, 2022, and I will share a link to the draft plan in the chat. And I invite all of you to read the draft plan and submit any comments um, that you may have to either myself, um, which I'll also put my email in the chat, or to the general community development email, which I can put in the chat as well. Um, additionally, we're gonna hold a public hearing to discuss the draft plan on Thursday, April 14th. Um, as part of our regularly held community development advisory board meetings. Um, the purpose of the public hearing will be to take public comment on the draft plan, um, which, um, yeah, which as I described, describes the activities that we're hoping to um, fund and qualifying populations we're hoping to target with this 2 million in funding. Um, so I'll post that up in the chat. And then my last update um, is I wanted to provide an update to this group on the downtown ambassadors program. Um, because it will be this program, which I think I brought to this group before, is going to be starting very soon within the next couple of weeks. Um, they've posted the job notices for this downtown ambassadorship program, and it's gotten a pretty healthy response so far. I think they've gotten upwards of about 50 applications and they've had interviews. I think the plan right now um, is for hiring to be taking place soon. So. I know there's been a lot of community questions on this program, and I think in response to this community interest, the managers of this new program wanted to make themselves available to introduce themselves to the public and answer any questions that the public may have. So I want to kind of share with this group that there will be an opportunity for folks to learn more about this, um, this program and other initiatives that are happening downtown at an information night, which will be held um, the evening of April 21st. Um, and it's gonna be hosted by the uh, Downtown Bellingham Partnership. And it's going to be hosted at the Boundary Bay Brewery Garden. And it's gonna feature representatives from various downtown programs, including this Downtown Ambassador Program, um, as well as some other kind of different downtown programs, a graffiti cleanup initiative that's gonna start. And folks from the Downtown Bellingham Partnership will be there. Um, so I don't have a flyer for this event, but I do have a link to the Facebook event. So I'll share that in the chat. Um, and I invite anyone who's interested in attending to RSVP and feel free to attend and, and ask any questions that you may have. Thanks, Katie. And uh, Bob Kumar from HOT and I are planning to be there to talk to anyone who's interested to learn more about HOT and how we're going to be interacting with the Downtown Ambassador um, Program. Chris, um, I kind of stole your thunder with the RFP, but do you want to give a, an update for the county? Uh, I actually don't have a whole lot to add. Um, and that thunder is uh, 
share at any time, Terry. So yes, that RFP is expected to be out on April 20th. So look for that. I think it'll come out through the Whatcom County um, Finance uh, section of our website. And maybe Terry, you or your son or your staff could send out a link to that uh, through this listserv. Uh, we do have some other RFPs coming out as well. There's a site-based behavioral health services RFP, a community leasing program RFP, and then uh, on a really related and relevant note, uh, an annual emergency shelter and interim housing uh, RFP as well. So to Doug's point, that's, you know, the severe weather is a piece of this. Um, it's connected to our other shelter and resources, uh, which in turn are connected to our other more permanent housing resources. So there's, there's actual movement throughout the continuum. Um, so stay tuned for more on those. But this first one, looking for an operator for winter shelter will be the first. Um, out here in a few weeks. Um, the others will follow later in the summer. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'll try to make this quick, an update from the service center. Um, I've got a staffing update. We've had um, a wild several months of staff turnover, but I'm really happy that um, Liz Nyberg, manager of the Homeless Service Center has staffed up coordinated entry. So two folks started this week, so thrilled to have them aboard another starting next week, but we still have positions that we're recruiting for. Um, one you might see on our website or on Craigslist is called the motel coordinator, but that um, after some discussion, we realized that's really a misnomer. That's not really the job. The job we're looking to recruit for is a family shelter specialist. I think that, I think I got that right. Um, and we're also recruiting for a landlord liaison. So the family shelter specialist, um, that's open until filled. So please share that information far and wide. We really would love to get someone great in this, in this job. Um, and the landlord lays in position closes on the 14th. So it's another week for folks to get their applications in. And there are a lot of us <laughs> that are recruiting for, for um, employees. Um, and a great way to keep abreast of that is to take a look at the community resource network. Um, and this is um, operated by Opportunity Council's Community Resource Center. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat to it because um, you can see all of the newsletters there and you can sign up to receive those newsletters and incorporated into that, they usually have other agencies, including Opportunity Council that are recruiting for positions. So love to get that information out as much as possible. Um, real quick, um, on the Way Station, Way Station is a partnership that's underway between Opportunity Council, Unity Care Northwest, uh, Peace Health, and um, Whatcom County. And that's going to be at the building that the Whatcom County Health Department occupies now on State Street. will be converted to um, kind of day services for hygiene and health care, so that's Unity Care for showers and laundry and that kind of thing. Um, and then the other side will be respite care for people who are experiencing homelessness and have nowhere to go, but they need more support after um, leaving the hospital. Um, so the permits were approved and we're working on our operations plan. And then my last update super fast is the point in time current. And I know everybody's um, interested for those numbers. Are they different? We had, uh, the date is actually select, not selected by us. It's selected and we all have to kind of follow that date. Well, the Department of Commerce changed the date, and I'm kind of appreciative of that because it, it coincided with um, the height of the Omicron surge. So I'm really glad that we didn't have to have folks in the field um, surveying people, but even so, we still um, are in the pandemic and, and not fully recruiting for volunteers as we have in the past. Um, but we have performed the count, we did an unsheltered count, um, and we expect that we may not have a draft of, of the report even until May because of that delay. Um, that's all my updates. And it looks like Vaughn has a comment or a question. Go ahead, Vaughn. Okay, uh, let me know if this is too far into the vortex, but back on, if I may, back to the thought about operators. Um, I was thinking one of, one of my difficulties with like trying to figure out how a nonprofit to start a nonprofit is just, there's there's just you got to have your board and your bylaws and all this and then trying to find something more flexible like a limited liability company so if it were so for example i just want to know if there's a heck no or a heck yes keep going with this like what if there were a bunch of say americorps alumni or something and we all have our basic cpr first aid and then we go on to niche academy and get all trained up and 
then we're ready and we're set, you know, and then we're, we're like, okay, for next winter, then we got to just make sure that we're insured. And that way, uh, maybe we're not insured year round, but we can get insured uh, when necessary, because then we have our, our medical training and that kind of thing. And um, that would give more flexibility to people and not be tied into, um, uh, not, not be like, oh, this nonprofit is my full-time job. You know, like this is my limited li liability company that I'm a part of and it fits into the rest of my life and my day job and all that. Um, so am I making sense? And can I, should I like explore more of this li limited liability company kind of a thing, like a, a mid middle person operator? If this is a bad idea, stop me. But I want to say, yes, yes, yes. Explore that. Uh, and just anecdotally, I have an LLC myself and we first started operating fun. I used to make a joke that we were a nonprofit because we weren't making any money. So <laughs> just because you have an LLC doesn't mean that you have to earn a profit. If you do this for the purpose of um, contracting with the government to provide this much needed service, I feel like that could potentially work. Am I crazy? Michael <laughs> says I'm crazy. <laughs> No, you're not crazy, but so incorporation is a legal mechanism to create an entity so that the entity can act and contract, can hire. A nonprofit corporation is an entity, a for-profit corporation entity. A city is a municipal corporation. An LLC is a limited liability corporation, um, which is its primary means there is, as it says, to protect the owners from legal exposure due to business failure. Um, I think the key is you just need to do incorporate to make an entity which isn't the people, right? That the nonprofit has a board or it has uh, members or, or whatever, and but it's the group that's responsible and the group lives on and the, the, the group is, you know, immortal or long lasting and it out survives the people who come and go. So LLC, nonprofit corporation, the hard part about a nonprofit is if you wanna be a 501c3, IRS approved nonprofit, but you can just incorporate as a nonprofit and not get 501c3 status. There's nothing wrong with a non-IRS approved nonprofit. You just accept, well, there is in the sense that people can't write off their, their donations to you. But be creating an entity, creating a corporation is important because it, it survives the people. Vaughn, okay, I just so want you to check oh. the chat because Chris put some definitions of um, eligible applicants in there. Thanks for that, Michael. I appreciate it. So, um, so just to see, like, to clarify, just to make sure I'm kind of getting this. So then, an LLC could still get donations, but people who donate wouldn't get a tax write-off on it. But, but an LLC could still get donations and would still be eligible for the grant, as as Chris said. And uh, and then I like the idea of like the immortal LLC that can carry on even though people leave, you know, and and that and therefore like uh, if if someone can can devote themselves for five years to it you know and then go they can and the and the entity lives on and, and you can nest these you can put qualified nonprofit inside an llc and then only one portion runs tax-free and the other is tax -free. Fun, I I like the way are, yeah and i hope these respondents are filling out the uh, survey monkey you made there terry yeah uh, I know we've ran over, and I'm sorry for that, but I just am really appreciative of this discussion. Um, I'm kind of energized by it, so <laughs> thank you. Um, it, at the end of our uh, agenda here, there's there's some time for public comment, so if anyone wants to say something, now's the time. We have about five minutes for that. All right, hearing nothing. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining. Our next meeting is going to be, oh, I did not put the right date on here. It's going to be in June. Um, let me just look at my calendar briefly. It's the first um, Thursday, June the 2nd, same time. Um, and we'll send agenda out in beforehand and looking forward to seeing you all there. And I can't wait to read the results of that survey monkey. Thanks so much.
Take care, everybody. Record.